I broke my nail. Oh, hello. I'm Mary. Uh, I'm Carla. And, and we're, we're the Smiley, Smiley Twins. Twins. And we are, she started up before I was ready. Yeah. Um, Bad we're back Adrian. With another episode of uh, Not Just Lip Service. And um, if you didn't see the last week's episode, it was really great. It was Courtney, a chief legal officer, interviewing um, Bob Dabolsky, who's another attorney and who's a good resource for us as, um, as well. And so you should go back and check that one out. They just cover some of that compliance and um, talks and Yeah, and some stuff. really meaty legal stuff to be on a yeah. rock solid on a podcast. Which, as you all know, we are really trying to push stuff like that out without or never giving legal advice. And, and most people know there's a fine line. You walk with that, um, and we, that's why we always say it. We say it jokingly, but we're very serious. Um, but we're proud to have a legal team. Um, it's something that a lot of people lack, um, or they, you know, go find the, the the random attorney or the random healthcare attorney that doesn't know the med spa law or whatever, or thinks he does and he doesn't, or she does. But so um, <laughs> today, a little tangent. <laughs> so go listen to it. It's really great. Um, Today we're going to talk about like basically things that can go wrong in your med spa. I think that's the title. Um, and kind of what to do with about it. We'll keep it pretty high level, but we had a lot of questions um, about some of this stuff when I think I was mentioning, I think I mentioned Kyla next and that prompted the conversation um, and then just doing this episode. So we really um, want your feedback on stuff and so let us know, you know, we have, we don't have a hard time coming with topics, but it's really nice when it comes from somebody else. So um, with that being said, I think we're going to kind of start clinically and then, um, move into kind of the business side of it. Um, and then yeah. we're going to stay away from the client stuff because Courtney will be back to do a podcast episode in a couple weeks or actually next, next week we episode. have one. Oh, yeah. It's amazing. She's interviewing. I'll talk about that at the end. Okay. So <laughs> <laughs> let's start with, um, what can go wrong in the med spa clinically and I'll obviously kind of lead this part of it. So there's of course a vascular occlusion, um, which is, you know, the, talk of the town uh, when it comes to clinically what goes wrong. Um, I mean, my be- biggest and best advice is knowing your anatomy and, um, you know, doing training. One training is not enough. Knowing who you're going to training for, don't get us down on that little tangent. Accredited. Um, I did recently post on Instagram um, a link to um, the Aesthetic Immersion, which I don't promote other people's stuff, but I can't help it. They're amazing. Lori Robertson and, and her partner, Dr. Gideon, they did a really great... Um, podcast on um, knowing how to vet your training, knowing how to vet other things. So um, like I said, I don't want to get on too big of a tangent, but nothing takes away from education when it comes to the vascular occlusion. So um, you should always follow the American Academy of Dermatological Society guidelines on what to do when you have a VO. That's what everyone will defer to, allergen, galderma. Um, And so knowing those, memorizing those steps. Um, And then I think the biggest thing, having Hyalinex in your med spa or on your person when you, if you are mobile, uh, is such a big, that's it. That's, that's the number one thing to do if you, um, what is Hylinex? Hylinex, if you are, um, doing dermal fillers in your practice, um, which is the number one topic. There are other things that can go wrong clinically, but right. that by far is, was one of the major things. Uh, Hylinex is, um, is the brand name. It's the only brand name in the United States that's FDA approved, um, to reverse hyaluronic acid dermal fillers, which is what most of us use. Um, of note, and this came up recently, even if you're Sculptra, you suspect a Sculptra VO, rare, but if you did Radiesque, any of any product, even if it's not hyaluronic acid, it basically, you should still defer to using um, using Hyalinex uh, to oh. see if you can't. Cause oh, Hyalinex, that's interesting. Yeah, the way that it works is it will increase blood flow and increase, um, increase basically fluid to that area. The idea being you're hoping. Maybe it'll yeah. revascularize. Yes, yeah, exactly. Because sure. your whole, the whole point is revascularization of whatever you've blocked off, whether it's compression or occlusion. So, um, you know, get a VO. We don't like talking about it. It's a matter of when. It's not a matter of if. And if you start changing that in your mindset and changing that as a provider, uh, it's, I hope I never get one. Stuff like that, I don't even like hearing and training. It's like, you know, just plan on it happening. If you continue to inject, you will eventually get one. And hiding behind it and not reporting it, not talking about it, I mean, reporting it to who, but just not talking about it or learning from it is detrimental to the industry and to practice. So it's so, we think, underreported, um, which is why our numbers are so low, which makes clients smile, but it also kind of um, yeah. skews, I don't know, skews their thoughts on, if it could happen from a process perspective i think it's important if you are an act if you actively inject to 
goes kind of into like clinical policies and procedures. Mm -hmm. You know, do you have, you know, sometimes uh, in the hospitals we had the quick hitter how to on like everything. Um, it's like, why would you not have those quick steps laminated? I'm not saying post it in a treatment room for your patients to see, but if you, you know, you're talking about memorizing those guidelines, we all know what happens. Not to all of us, some of us sharpen up in moments of That's a good point, yeah. in emergency, but others of us Breeze. blank out and, yeah. and just stroke out. So having those printed, laminated, um, that idea. type of stuff, uh, and it's, it's, it's a few steps. I mean, it's not yeah. like, it's very simple. So you could, it's a one pager that you could have um, always available. Yeah, um, when we, we have a suspected um, occlusion or, or potential necrosis pol policy. Like we have a whole separate policy yeah. for it as my aesthetics. Um, and so, you know, what, to her point, dumbing that down into steps or whatever to help the, especially for your new providers that could go, that's right. in our injector handbook that every, every injector that comes on board with us, you know, gets and stuff. So, um, yeah, make, taking steps like that. Yeah, to make I mean, sure that it's like it's like uh, the heart attack care. steps. Yeah, what are care. those? Morphine, oxygen, nitro, aspirin, right. something along those lines. Yeah. Yeah, it used to be Mona. So, um, so yeah, it, it, that's kind of obvious, I think, but yeah. Hylodex being the kicker, hopefully yeah, most people, took oxygen off. if you're listening to this and you own a med spa or you already practice, you know what Hylodex is. Um, but if not, feel free to message and we can talk about it. Um, and then other clinical things, I think the big other thing to talk about is like infection. Um, I don't think we've yet to have an infection that we're aware of, yeah. of Smiley, at Smiley Aesthetics, which is great, aseptic technique. I'm not going to dive into that. It's very important. Um, but having, once again, we have policies and procedures for how we disinfect, what we use, um, and those are all in our injector handbooks as well for everybody. The biggest thing with um, if you suspect an infection is, once again, knowing what to do with it, knowing what it looks like. We all, hopefully all our medical providers know what a... Um, infection or suspected infection looks like and just knowing what you're going to do you're either going to reach out to your medical director for a prescription your advanced provider having all of that in place if you're listening to this and you're a registered nurse and you're like i don't have any of that how how would how how would you write a prescription if somebody got an infection uh that is a problem and kind of ma makes you want to look like look at the structure of of what you're doing if you're an rn that runs a med spa with estheticians and, and whatever and so, um, Slow down talking. You're like talking too fast for me right now, just for the record. Well, you're a little like blah, so perk up. I am a little tired. Snap too. I don't know if y'all know, yesterday but... was Halloween. Adult and children. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> so, so yes, infection. Um, and then I'll, t I'll speak to one other thing. There's an acute inflammatory response. Okay. That does happen. Well, I want to get through the clinical stuff. This isn't really about that so much. But yeah, but it is important. Some people don't think about the fact of infection when it comes to aesthetics. It's, it's ignored. Oh, well, hopefully you're thinking about it. Well, I mean, a lot of people aren't thinking about, you know, giving somebody an infection with Botox. Like, I don't know right. if I've ever seen or heard or read any or ever seen it before. So it isn't often thought about. So it's a good reminder. Yeah, more so with fillers and like microneedling and, yeah, okay. So acute inflammatory response versus an anaphylactic, let's talk about this, an, an acute allergic response, like someone is actually having an allergic response while they're sitting in the chair versus an acute inflammatory response versus infection. So this acute inflammatory response gets confused all the time from having an allergic reaction. And that is not the same thing. Very similar cascade when you wanna look at it, nerd out on it and look at it at, from a medical standpoint of what happens in your body, but it can happen one month, two months, five months, 10 months down the road. Um, when you have filler in your face, it's usually associated with filler, can be sculpture or radius, anything injected into your body, not typically Botox, because obviously it doesn't last that long. So is it kind of like a rejection of like an organ in that regard, yeah, like the delayed it's like, reaction? It's usually it's usually um, brought on by like, uh, maybe you had a virus. You didn't even, mm -hmm. you might have even, you had another something going on, your body already responded, your immune system already responded, and then it was like, what is that? what is that in your face and it's like mm, now we don't like that anymore we're gonna be like mm, yeah that needs to go as well and then it's like start swelling around it gets red so you get a virus down the road and it just oh your body overreacts yeah, say virus. Any infection. yeah yeah sure something sure. peaks your immune response and then it realizes you have this foreign substance in your body and it's like yeah no yeah, we're, we're gonna, gonna get rid of that. We're, we're gonna get rid of that. <laughs> attack! While, while we're at it, yeah. Attack! Yeah, attack. your white blood cells are running around. They're like, ooh, look at this. So uh, that's that's kind of a very high level of what happens. But when it happens, uh, there's usually panic ensues <laughs> by the client. Um, and but it can be very easily controlled without dissolving whatever's in there. So you know the steroids, the Benadryl, um, and you're writing for a steroid prescription. Okay, it's, so that's important to. That's the, probably the one of the biggest differences is that if you have an allergic reaction, a true allergic reaction, you want to get rid of said allergen 
immediately. Right, and in that instance, which those are very, very, very rare, they will most likely still be in your chair, right? Because most allergic reactions, while they can happen up to two hours after, are relatively quick. Okay, so that's the important thing to differentiate is that it's, I mean, it is, we all know that an allergic reaction happens, you know, typically. Pretty quickly. Within, day up, let's say day up. Yeah, within an anaphylactic 20 minutes up to two hours, yeah. whatever. So you would want to get rid of said allergen. That makes perfect sense. But if this is down the road, that's the important part that's different is it's not an, the same allergic reaction. It's very different. So therefore, get the thought of removing the allergen out of your head, which well, would be dissolving the filler. Well, it's not that you want to take it out of your head. Well, it's I just, just mean yeah. it's just a different thought process of, okay, a bee stung me. Let me not be around a bee. That's right. not, it's not the same thing. Right. So this happened recently um, with one of our employees, actually, his family members. And my response to it was we treated it just as such an acute inflammatory response like you know it can last for a long time the swelling and stuff or whatever and it you know sometimes it can mimic and if you get rid of the filler will that response go away yes. okay so that's where someone might right. you know after a day or two if it's not right. going away they may but be you like could just treat get rid it as of it. like as if you had hives so like i said a steroid and a benadryl then you don't have to worry about dissolving your lips and when their lips look amazing they don't may not look amazing in the moment right because they can swell you can have soft wake up and have sausage lips and three months after you got lip filler, six months, and that is that acute inflammatory response kind of happening. You are having an allergic reaction, but it is not it it's is quite not the, the same. same. So if you do Benadryl and steroids and they go down, it's, could it then happen again? Or well, they co it comes back? It sh so you, the thought process would be that your body had that, launched that immune response, things were created, and then hopefully, maybe not. Maybe it's like, it's all yeah. kind of oh, already yeah, they, they, Yeah, I got it, got However, it, However, like I told this client recently, if it happened again, I would be like, well, let's just dissolve it. So, yeah. yeah, take your risk and your benefit with kind of, you know, got with it. how it comes and how your client panics or doesn't panic. If they're panicking off the wall and just, you know, you, obviously it's like dissolve, but you're just trying to educate them on what's happening and talk them off a ledge and yeah. kind of, you know, it's, it's, it's okay. And if you'll work with me, if you'll uh, you stay in close contact, daily close contact with them, yeah. um, you would at that point, you know, do a Z-Pack and, and, you know, the Benadryl, if they can tolerate it, uh, there's other allergy medicine options. There's other, we're not gonna dive into exactly what you should do for that response, but there is a pretty decent laid out protocol that the industry uses that's kind of a standard for what can we can do. Can you find that on that same guidelines, the American? I don't think that's, I don't think so. That is more geared towards vascular occlusion. I got it. And what you should do if you're actually, you've blocked blood flow. This is, um, don't hold me to that, but I don't think so. But when I, I don't know that there is a very standard set protocol. The I'm point just is saying, it's different than an allergic reaction. Right, I'm just saying that yeah. most people follow. It sounds like it's the protocol is basically an allergic reaction protocol. Right, follow. The point is just don't freak out and dissolve. Right, or, yeah. people follow, I think individual practices follow their own guidelines, but it consists of the Benadryl, the steroids, the, um, you know, other sometimes other allergy medicine. Um, so that's the other kind of thing clinically, that acute inflammatory response versus obviously the immediate reaction. Um, and what was the, th uh, versus the... Um, Fast, oh. I had three. In acute, acute inflammatory response versus an allergic reaction. Um, maybe that was it. Okay, so... Anaph versus like anaphylaxis? Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, obviously someone's throat's closing. <laughs> if I need to talk about that, then we should probably... You know, yeah, we should start we should questioning medical licenses. Yeah. M move on. So... Sure. Um, because that is a obviously called 911. So, um, and then I want to point out a little tip. If you have vision changes for the vascular occlusion side, you're still implementing your Hyalinex protocol, but you have called 911 first. Uh, vision changes are nothing to try. I, don't try to fix it yourself. <laughs> um, you know, and if you do fix it yourself, kudos. They probably should still go to the ER and have an op. You know, uh, hopefully you can send them to a hospital that is equipped with. What causes? Why would they have vision changes? Like what that happens they? a lot. Well, the retinal artery. At some point, somewhere, you know, typically it's nose and temples, but it can happen from the emperor oil. Anything that connects to your retinal artery, which you're going to give me down a wormhole. Everyone's different. So just because we don't think that, like, you know, you're in your superior labial artery, it doesn't have any connection with your labial artery. Not true. It can go up to your alar artery, which then connects to your emperor oil, which then has a connection to your retina. And the idea would be that the filler has back, has retrograde, uh, has made its way all the way back. Somehow it's like floated its way back up there and then it eventually blocks. A okay, so branch. for any filler in the face, essentially, other than lips or lips included? No, I'm saying don't ever assume that someone doesn't have an anatomical anomaly 
that could cause the vision change. If from any filler in the face. Yeah, let's just say that. Be safe, sure. Yeah. Most, most commonly, it's temple and nose for obvious reasons. Got it. Could but, the lip, could that happen with lips? Well, like I just said, a, a superior labral artery up here Got could it. connect to an ailer, which then can connect up here or Yeah, which you can only what if yourself so much, right? Sure. You can what if yourself so, to death. with that all being said, following your sexy techniques when you're injecting filler in general is the best way to go. My point is, there is a total blanket rule of if there are vision changes while your client is sitting in the chair, Right. And you are injecting a product, any product, into their face. It's not going to happen with Botox, but you know, any product, and they have vision changes. Sure. They should be sent to the hospital to ensure that um, that is not yeah. something. Something yeah. you know, you have not. You wouldn't inject Hyalinex though if you were injecting Botox and they had vision of changes. Of course, but you would start Just injecting Hyalinex if they had vision changes. With you any call nine one and then you sure. would inject it where you thought it maybe have happened with the hopes of getting some of that Hyalinex into that artery, and it going up and fixing your problem. Um, but that's kind of what we can say about that. So those are a couple of the clinical questions that we had. Um, so let's move on to like med spa stuff, like actual like kind of business stuff. Like what do you need, you know, or if someone walks in and trips? Yeah. What, what part of what, you, what we have, you know, helps us, just the stuff that we don't necessarily think about because sure. it's all covered by us um, by the hospital. So if you own a med spa, if you don't outright own the building, um, and if you outright on the building, then you should definitely do this. But then most landlords are going to require you to have some kind of general liability. So when she's talking about tripping and falling, that falls under general liability. Or they're, you know, in the bathroom and you have a um, ADA required bar for people to be able to get on and off the toilet, which is required 100% of the time now. You lean on that bar and it falls, breaks, and they fall and crack their head open. Whatever. I mean, there's no professional liability. Nothing you did professionally caused that to happen. It's general liability. So and that's the question that has come up recently was that. Professional versus is, general. Right, right. Right. So so professional liability is something happened as you were um, doing or implementing your professional skill. The reason that in most med spa instances or for aesthetic injectors, we don't necessarily have to have that and in medicine in general is because you carry malpractice. And so now that means that if you do something, um, whatever, it covers, your malpractice will cover a variety of things. Um, most cover almost anything, uh, negligence, all of it. Some cover more, some cover less, but in general, that is professional liability. You, you have professional liability. What a lot of times someone will do is carry professional liability if they're, um, a barber in a barber shop and they cut your ear off with some scissors. <laughs> that is not general liability, that's professional okay, liability. Yeah. Oh, that's a good, okay, that's a good, I mean, that's a morbid, a terrible example. A little bit but morbid, but I mean, because, a, sense, yeah, because right? okay. a barber is not going to have medical, not going to have yeah, malpractice, malpractice, right? Because yeah. malpractice is pretty much um, associated no. with, uh, mm -hmm. well, medical malpractice associated with medicine. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, those are some of the differences between those terms. Professional liability and malpractice are pretty synonymous yeah. for medical providers. Um, you can carry both. Professional liability, a lot of times, um, well, you can carry well, both your if you pot, want. Though, sometimes, to your point, some, some of the malpractice companies even say professional liability insurance. No, yeah, that's, that's what, it what it is. Yeah, yeah. We, just, we just have a special little category right. because we don't typically, because it's based off of the fact that hospitals, I mean, um, uh, medical providers work typically not for themselves. That's right. where that really comes from. You're working in a hospital, um, so you carry whatever, um, or you're working somewhere else. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so if you're a med spa, you definitely want to have general liability because again, they could come in and trip on a cord or whatever, mm -hmm. or they could come in and just trip over their own gosh darn freaking feet. And they could say, you know, there was some humidity on the floor and I slipped. Yeah. You know, you that's can't maybe a key point. Is yeah. Like, you know, you're covering, if you think it can't happen, like, Oh, the, the funny thing about general is it's not, general liability is covering, this is, this is just, it sounds terrible, but it's covering people's crazy, yeah. is what it is. <laughs> it just is, because. Uh, yeah, there's definitely instances <laughs> where our little robot vacuum, someone could trip over him if he was walking yeah, around. Yeah, and then but, they get uh, pissy with you, and they didn't, it's been, it's sitting there. I mean, you know, we have clear floors, and they just fall over their feet. And I say that, that's, that's a, that's, don't, you know, I shouldn't say that, but it really is protecting no, you I kinda against. No, I kind of like that. It makes, it, it makes the point, for yeah, sure. Yeah, it's protecting against, like. No one, I did not intend for you to, you know, you leaned on that and sure, you know, it, you, you're, I mean, let me give a better example. Oh, I gotta give it, I gotta give it. A fluffy person sitting in a chair that breaks. You went fluffy. That's what I was going after with the disability I knew you were. bar. Twins. You know, yeah. So, yeah, you, and, and the chair breaks, right? There's nothing wrong with the chair and it holds a weight up to 300 pounds. So, I, you know, 
what are you going to tell somebody not to sit down? I mean, it's just a difficult. There's just so many situations. General liability is covering all the crazy. And that doesn't mean someone, an individual is necessarily crazy, but it also can mean just the crazy things, things that, that happen. happen yeah. Like, yeah like, I think, yeah. Or my that's God, I've walked it up and down these, this one yeah. step 800 times. But it does and cover I the crazy, trip. too, where it that, does. That there are people who seek, literally seek out the 100%. opportunity. 100%. So it covers you there, too. Real quick, before I, we move, move on or forget about it, this is different than fire, flood, and <laughs> um, hazard like yes. insurance mm -hmm. because another question that I yeah general um, liability does not cover so if you want that if you're building a well, somehow property a insurance is really right. what it is okay. so so you have general liability you have professional liability and then you have property insurance which and that's, typically if you're renting your landlord has to exactly the buildings so almost a hundred percent of the time right. you are covered under your land okay. and you should be for yeah. the record if someone says you have to pay for that or some more portion you start negotiating but as we close on this building uh, that we will own we will have general liability, we will actually have professional liability associated with some of the people who work in the building who are not medical, who are not doing any medical work anymore. Mm -hmm. And then we will have um, property insurance. And then we'll have, uh, it's either called business, business property or personal property insurance, because then we will also insure that what's in there, you know, like if we have Botox and fillers or whatever in there, or we have a machine in there, we want that covered if the building burns down. So there is a lot to consider. Um, insurance agents, you know, they kind of sometimes, you know, with all due respect, it's a kind of used car salesman feel. And, you know, truthfully, you can insurance yourself to death. Um, people want insurance for everything, and you literally end up paying. <laughs> You, you know, I think, yeah. so for the record, I think our current premium, you know, like on our company, because if you do have employees, you're required to have workers' compensation insurance policy as well. So all in, and we're a 15-person company with five med spas, um, and we have some assets. 15, at, oh, actual, like employees. Mm -hmm. And we have some, employees, yep, yeah. and we have some assets, like we have some actual physical, like a scarlet machine, a couple, like whatever. Um, I think our premium a year is around 13000 So, Ooh. yeah, and that, well, that sounds like a lot. I mean, it's a little over $1,000 a month, but it is also covering, like, five med spas and, well, yeah, you know, I mean, a bunch of people. Like yeah, machines, and, I mean, machines, if yeah. one person went down and needed workers' comp and to cover their salary, I mean, that's way more than $1,000 a right. month. So, um, so there, it's obviously worth it, but it's just being aware that you can be insurance poor, and you just have to be very careful with that um, because it is an expense. Yeah. Um, but it's definitely one that's worth it. Um, and you should you should have, and a lot of people require to have. So yeah. um, that's a good one in terms of like what can go wrong. Yeah. Um, okay. So um, let's speak a little more um, uh, specifically about like malpractice because so what can go wrong is this is a back to clinical a little bit, but let's bring it over to the mal to the business side. So I do. Let's talk, and this is getting a little into liability and a little into compliance and stuff, but but not really. So let's say I. Um, I occlude, you know, I occlude someone's a lip. A lip. I occlude, I occlude a lip, and um, so that happens, you know, that happens on on Wednesday. And let's let's say let's do the scenario. Of I did exactly what I'm supposed to do, and everything turned out fine because typically it does. When you follow up with them, end up dissolving. You try massaging. I'm not gonna go through the steps. I did everything I was supposed to do, or at least to the best of my ability. Stayed in communication, you know, whatever. I did not ghost the client because, real quick, sidetrack, can't help it. A lot of the stuff we see on the internet where people's faces look horrible and they're black and rotting, and those unfortunately are from providers that and or I, clients. Hold on, I say providers. <laughs> Providers, not necessarily medical providers, so people who don't even have access to, access to Hylax because it is a prescription medicine, so that you get from a pharmacy. Um, that um, so the provider goes to them because they can't do anything about it. I've literally had people come, many people since coming yeah, back we to have. Nashville, not as much in Knoxville, but in Nashville, for me to dissolve their stuff because their provider does not have it because they're not a medical provider. So they provider. literally ghost them. It's yeah, terrible. so they'll just stop talking mm -hmm. to them as soon as the client is like, I want this dissolved, or I'm having problems, or I think this is this is right. wrong, I'm hurting. They also haven't educated them on it, like I said, tangent. So the person who injected them has ghosted them, um, or um, the client themselves just doesn't, you know, we, <coughs> we all know that now typically clients will follow directions because it's they their value face. their face. Yeah. However, every now and then you have someone that just won't listen or or they don't want to go back to the provider that treated them, which is a little more understandable because there's some mistrust there, but they won't allow them to treat them appropriately so too much time passes. So those are kind of things, but those are the pictures that end up on the internet when they're so bad. I mean, it's like, you know, three days later and, and it's still all black and nothing has clearly been done to help it. Because at some point, I like to say you have 72 hours to really 
um, get blood flow back going there before the tissue really dies. For and, a compression occlusion? Well, any occlusion. For it to be when it, if it's totally occluded, you know, your body will do collateral flow. This isn't a lesson on, on VOs, but um, that 72 hour rule is a really good rule of just total no blood flow to the area, the tissue will die and it will die irreparably. It cannot be fixed. Um, so, with that being said, at Smiley, we do a lot of 24 hour stuff. Let's watch and wait for 24 hours after we've massaged, after the warm compress, after, you know, we had these, cap refill again. Yeah, these like, basic yeah, steps. Sure. It's, oh, look, I definitely got a little bit better. Let's see if your body yeah. creates a little collateral flow. Let's see how it goes. And then after the 24 hour work, we really start deciding are we going to dissolve? Are we going to, what do we do? Sure. We don't wait the whole 72 hours, of course. We don't really even wait 48. We just start taking taking a lot of action and seeing how it's over overnight. So, um, where was it? Oh, so let's say I, I did everything I was supposed to do. And mm -hmm. this person ended up with um, dissolved filler, but um, no issues at all. Uh, you know, let's say f two days later, she maybe had a blister or two where, you know, had lack of blood flow for five seconds. And, and other than that, though, that's all cleared up. Her skin looks perfectly normal. How is that? It, am I going to be sued? Am I, for those four days of discomfort, am I, you see what I'm getting at? I do. Uh, and because it's, you know, we've had probably, I guess, not really attempts, but the answer is no. I mean, you anybody can bring a lawsuit against anybody. That's what makes our country uh, fair and just, I suppose, depending on what side of the fence you're on. But you can bring a lawsuit against anybody. That doesn't mean it's going to stick. So, sure, that person could technically go file a lawsuit against you. But right. did I think your question is, did you act or violate your practice or... You know, did you did you did you act in malpractice? Right. It's really a question of like negligence. Yeah. My question is not yeah. so much that. Yeah. Because that would be a com like that's like asking an attorney. It's more like how does your malpractice, how does malpractice relate to me? Like I have malpractice, I would be totally covered, and I'll just answer my own question. I'm not being clear. Like yeah. What, anyway, was I neglect? Basically, your malpractice is is asking the question or is covering you for if you were totally um, responsible and you were not negligent in any way, like I just said, I did everything I could right within with within my, that I know to do, I did everything right within my education and stuff, um, then if that person sued. And it went through? It, well, let's just, well, went through. Like, they brought a lawsuit against you. Should I be worried? And I don't ever want to say you wouldn't worry about a lawsuit, but, but the answer is no, is what I'm yeah, trying to Yeah, I, I think I you get what you're saying. You're you saying you did. Medical you did. directors ask this all the time. Am I going to be sued if someone gets a vascular occlusion and they right. get mad? And it's like. Did you well, guys part of the co the conversation that you you left out is you're assuming also that there were uh, appropriately documented informed consents. <laughs> well, <laughs> which sure. is another part of this so too. So I'm saying I did everything I was supposed to do. Yeah. But but let's it might be, this might be way easier. Let's say I didn't. Let's talk about how my practice won't help you. Oh, I have my practice. So I'm covered. I'm covered for everything. I'm good. I'm no, well, no. you're covered. Well, right. You're yeah. covered. But how a lawsuit can be brought against you because I'm just trying to get to the point that like it's all about. Did you do everything that you could do within your scope of practice to fix whatever happened? Yeah, and malpractice covers when you don't. Right. Right. So, so that's kind the of reason I'm... you have malpractice is if you do screw up or you do make a bad decision or you are negligent or who knows. Right. Malpractice is covering you for it, it, malpractice isn't for you're not you're not you don't you're not considered having been done malpractice if you have an, an, a conclusion that's a normal risk that happens. This is what I'm getting. This is yeah, what I'm getting. Yeah. So, at. so a loss. That's what I'm talking about. A lawsuit going through. So they may anybody can sue you, but there there would even there would be no file against your malpractice. Now you could uh, potentially file against your malpractice for any lawyer fees or things you needed to get that to go away. Um, but typically, that's on the person right. who sued. They do. Because um, they'll, yeah. they'll bring it forth to the... Exactly. Videos, but then, let's imagine it goes through. Let's imagine you did do something. Like, you didn't... Okay, I have a good example. You ran out of Hylonex <laughs> the previous day, and oh my gosh, you got another... Yeah, and that caused, that caused some undue harm onto a person, because if you had had it, you made you a decision. You, you made a decision. You made a yeah. decision as a medical provider to not follow your own policies and procedures or whatever and have the safety thing. Your clients. Yes. Yeah. Then they if they sued you then yes, that's what you would they would go through as go through meaning it would be accepted, Most it would likely. go to court whatever. Yeah, you know, we don't know that. We're just Yeah, saying. we talk about settling. All that stuff is what your malpractice covers. Yeah. Uh, a typical malpractice for um, aesthetics is a one one in 3 million. Um, so 1 million I think well, current. Well, that's just kind of what we that's pretty standard. No, yeah, no, that's just, standard malpractice medic, for nursing. For yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. in general. Yeah. Um, and that, so I mean, a million dollars is a good little bit of money. Um, mm -hmm. Unless you burn someone's, you know, you, unless you, you know, the half their face dies, well, a million ain't gonna cover shit. Um, excuse my French. But that's why you have an LLC. 
uh, quite frankly, if we would really get into that, because mm -hmm. these are things that can go wrong. That's why we highly encourage it to be an LLC and why um, you should have that stuff siloed away mm -hmm. because they will file it against you as the provider, but your LLC. Right. Uh, and once that bankrupts, uh, you know, you're not going to give up your house and your right. food for your children um, because of which again that's a different a whole nother conversation but um, protecting yourself in that regard yeah so I bring it up or kind of trying to not articulate myself well but bring it up because people are so scared there's such a fear which I love it being a healthy fear I love the healthy fear of vascular occlusions just stay on that um, but bring it up because I don't ever want it to keep somebody from, there's such a misunderstanding of if I have a vascular occlusion, I'm automatically going to get in trouble. I'm automatically going to be sued. I'm, and it's like, just no, remembering yeah. that when you're practicing, when you're doing things, either you're delegated this practice of medicine or you're practicing medicine, that like if you, if you are practicing within your scope, you are doing what you're supposed to be doing, which is clearly defined by the law, then. Yeah, I, I mean, a, a simple analogy, guys, is, is if I'm a brain surgeon performing a brain procedure, I mean, a, a surgery, and the patient dies, you know, it that you didn't, there's no malpractice. I mean, assuming you did everything right to your point, there's not, it's not malpractice. No one gets to sue. Assuming like, it's did, a yeah, risk, bet, yeah. a, a risk associated that was in the informed consent and someone signed off on saying, this can happen, just yeah, so you know. Not, yeah, no. But as long as I do everything I can to prevent it and do everything right. correctly, then it's not my fault that it happened. I've, I've also heard providers say that, well, they signed an informed consent and it's like, yeah, but if you don't respond to them for four days, um, or you no don't, way. or you didn't aspirate and you were, you were video recording yourself doing a set of lips. And then you put that on social media, and that client just so happened. Yeah, I mean, I'm just making well, it up. That's well, a, or you go, no, no, this is serious. You you video yourself doing a set of lips, and you ask the client's permission, and they're like, yeah, you don't ever have to post it. But that client, in the middle of that appointment, let's just imagine, or later, got some kind of inclusion. Well, they know you recorded them. That is absolutely discoverable. And well, if you sure. didn't aspirate during well, that video. is not a law, so no. I'm going to push back on you a little bit. Well, I'm required to aspirate. It's not, I, no, I no, no, it doesn't be, have to be, nothing is required. I know, I'm just saying, I don't know that that would prove negligence. My, my, no, 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 yes it would. Yes it would. So this is a good, I'm glad we're talking about this. If you have a policy in place that says you're supposed to, okay, let's take a different example. You're supposed let's to take a different one. You're supposed to scrub the hub on a pick line for 15 seconds to prevent infection. Okay, that's very different than the other No, one. if our policy is. When if I were an expert witness on that case, I'd be like, what, late, was it a shallow injection? Was it a picket fence injection? Because there's no, I wouldn't require an If we, okay. I would not. If we have in our policy and procedure that when you're doing dermal filler that you aspirate every time. We don't. I'm, this is it's a bad I mean, example. This, no, it's not. I liked your other example. Okay, so we'll take the pick line example. You're doing a vitamin There's not a law that says you have to scrub the hub on a pick line for, there's a law. There's clinical evidence which would then create policies and procedures. Right. And so that right. policy and procedure of the hospital or the organization yes. is what you are going to be sued against. Yeah. So okay, that's my point. One, there's not really evidence for that either. That's what I'm pointing out. Okay, but it doesn't matter. If we decided at Smiley to put aspiration as a step in our derma filler policy pr procedure, and then you didn't do that, that is evidence to say you didn't even follow your own procedure and this is what happened. That's how people get in trouble. We'll never do that. Oh, my God. I can't right now. But anyway, I think you get the point. So uh, all that to say, in summary, I don't want to – people get scared, I think, when they're coming into – really, any. I think as a new nurse, you're scared of doing something wrong and the patient's going to, you know, make a mistake and you're automatically done with your entire Vital career. Vital signs. Yeah, ah! your, entire, your entire career is over, and that's just not true. So if you get a – you know, let's say you get a vascular in our first patient. If, you, if you've educated yourself, have the stuff, stuff that you need. Uh, appropriately in the medical aesthetics world it's, it's a little more gray than say some of the stuff that we have evidence-based practice for for sure it's a new industry so there are things that we're you know still kind of learning however there is definitely still room for negligence to be negligence to be proved if say you don't have any highlights on hand for example it's not a law that says you have to but it's definitely something that we know uh, is the answer and so, just one more plug on that that's a reason why you see a policy um, in a hospital by example that's very broad and generalize because just be careful what you do put on paper um, is what you are then tying yourself to. So you always, you know, it's cool to have a procedure that's detailed down to the nitty gritty, but if it says you have to use your left hand to scrub and your right hand to hold a kneecap, well then that is what you're going to be held to. Held to. So you need just be aware of that. 
Um, there's got to be a level of detail and procedures, but they're That's also... That's a really good point. That does it, broad enough. But. Yeah, there's a there's an art. People think, oh, I'll just write a policy. Yeah, because you yeah, got to no, There's have an art one. to that. Yeah, that's a good. You got to have one. Yeah, you, you got to have one for this. You got to have one for this. doing dermal fillers. You got to have mm -hmm. one for hyalinex. You got to have one for reversal, whatever the case is. That is why we are so big on having attorney approved policies and procedures. But, uh, what that well, means. you got to be, yeah. I mean, an attorney doesn't necessarily help. They do help. Well, they're you, more versed in like writing something that covers what you want covered, but is not sealing yourself to. Yeah, sure, sure. Like, I mean, that's like a contract. You know, yeah, so. I mean, that, yes. Um, I'll put in a little plug for our Patreon on here because we load a lot of the stuff that we use that, um, you know, I'm careful about what I'm going to say here, but that we use at Smiley. So I'll just leave it like that. That, um, you know, has been put through the ringer with our legal team. And we do try to post some of those things. Our, uh, I think I've got Botox, microneedling filler up on the Patreon right now on the subscription side because those things take time and cost money, but um, that are really good examples of general but specific. And so, mm -hmm. um, you know, that can kind of, uh, we're not perfect or anything, but um, that kind of work on the, that very yeah, good point yeah. that she just said. Yeah. Um, okay. So we kind of did some of the clinical stuff. I, we, I really, that's what I really wanted to do was go through the professional liability, the malpractice. I feel like I've had an influx of questions about that. Well, we had a good, like a Dear Abby uh, thing come in, column thing about um, culture. I think we could, mm. like, because, because, so, I mean, yeah, if you're independent, sure, there's, you're, you're outsourcing a lot of things or the vendors or the people that you use to do, um, you know, your accounting, your marketing, whatever. Those are all outside people, and so they're not with you day to day. So culture isn't something that everybody thinks about because right. you're just you're independent. Um, but we had somebody write in and ask about, uh, basically they made their first, well, this is their second hire. And um, on paper, this person's basically perfect, good interview, all the kind of stuff. They produce wonderful stuff, but they just don't jive with the culture. So this, though, this, this is a really important point because this is how multiple ones are. They do their job. And they, and they do, do it well. well. <laughs> and they do it well. And like, the question is, fire this person? It's a he. Fire don't. him or not? Yeah, and I'm they like, do. he is not jiving with the rest of the mm -hmm. group, and it's not a male female thing, nothing like that. No, he doesn't no. jive with the rest of the group. What I, mean, I don't know what to do. What do I? Because do? they're producing, and boy, it's going yeah, well. Yeah, and, and to replace them would be detrimental. And he's so doing. Yeah. Another mm -hmm. thing that we talk about, it'd be detrimental to the company, but maybe positive for the people in the company. It's yeah. Like, what do you put first? Where yeah, do you, and, and you know, all leadership theory, all kinds of theorists. Um, there's all books and and. Psh, just an endless amount of things to to be said about this, but in my opinion, and, and from my you know what I believe as as in my leadership and well, in your extensive and what experience I yeah, as wrote well about as education, it, yes, <laughs> in my um, dissertation is that basically the principle that if you've already thought about whether or not you should fire the person, you're too late um, because that's what, a hard pill to swallow. That is a hard pill to swallow, but that uh, if it comes up, um, then you're already behind the eight ball generally mm -hmm. um, because if you're thinking of um, and, and if whether or not you're in an at-will state or for cause or whether you've started the process or nothing at all. Are all things to think about. They're things to think about. But if you bring it up, gosh, I, I, need, to, I need to get rid of this person, you're probably already behind. And, mm -hmm. and that should help guide um, heavily. It should already, it tips the scale to like, you're already 90% should fire. Okay, Maybe there's some questions. considerations. So is it a question of, I sh is the question that I'm asking myself, Man, I think I need to fire. Like I, I, I need to fire this person. Versus, the first thought, the the thought that pops in of like, gosh, should I consider letting this person go? Are those two different things, or are those, in your opinion, basically the same thing? No, I mean, if you, well, they're basically the same thing. But if the first time it pops into your head that you should consider letting somebody go, there's already so enough that has fed right, that. Right. That is an idea. That's not a seed anymore. It's planted. It's sprouted You're in right, your brain. Because it comes the after seed, an event Yeah, the seeds after, that okay. were planted are all the events that happen and were watered and cultivated, and then you have this plant that's like. I should fire this person, or maybe I should think about it. That plant came from all of these. There's roots. There's already right. issues. And then it's like there's I, poison. I need to fire them, and you need to fire them like that day, and then you don't even have time to, or you know, then it's yeah. Like, well, then so you then you slow step? down, yeah. right? Yeah. So then, so so to well, me, well, maybe hopefully you can. To your point. Well, in theory, yeah. I mean, if you got a liar, a cheater, a stealer, I mean, you got all kinds of things. But like, if sure, if they steal something from you, that's just is what it is. But if you're considering, then we're talking about the person. You're like, man, I think I should let this person go. This mm -hmm. just isn't working out. Yeah. Whether it's personality driven, if it's um, um, if it's production driven, that's pretty easy, right? You're not yeah. producing and paying you. It's very easy for us to say, I paid for that and I'm not getting it. 
I'm out. That's easy. But when it's somebody who like, you know, their personality sucks or they're pissing everybody off like that. And that was the question. That's a lot harder to quantify. You're mm -hmm. not paying for a personality. You're paying yeah. them to do the job. Then you want to tell your other people like get with it a little bit. But then do you? Then it's just like. Yeah, it's a balance. there. That's yeah. where leadership skills and principles all come into play. And as a manager of people, you have to, you know, look at you can read about managing conflict in the workplace. And I mean, there's whole friggin. Oh, encyclopedias God, yeah. on it. Don't we have um, to do that when we go in the hospital? You have to have, there's always, that's like one of the annual. I can't tell you how many I've read. read. Quint Studer, for a recommendation, is um, um, the Studer principles are, are, I'm a big fan of his, uh, his writings, his teachings. Um, Hardwiring Excellence is one of the best books I've ever read. I talk about it all the time. Um, he has a bunch of different stuff and a whole way of employee management, retention, um, hiring, firing. Hardwiring Excellence, that's true. Well, it was, it was, I don't know, eight years of HCA leadership and inundation with everything that he did um and i liked it if you didn't like it you were in trouble um but a, that's the what um hca goes off of mm -hmm, oh, that's mm -hmm. interesting so that's let's talk we, about yeah. uh, smiley so what we've done here is interesting in my opinion or what we are trying to do or what you know carl and i's values and courtney's um are very aligned in the culture that we wanted to create from the very beginning um we do things like unlimited pto and um you know, we allow work from home when it's, when obviously it's appropriate, um, you know, Basically any time. I mean, yeah. the, the overarching theme, sorry, let me interrupt you. I think the overarching theme, that's one positive about building your own business is you get to decide all the things yeah. you didn't like when you were with somebody else. Well, good, pick them now. Uh, it's funny and you'll start to see how there are things that you thought you weren't aligned with and then when it's your own employees, you're like, you know what? But it's really <laughs> I do want that to be there, and now right. I understand why that was there. Even though as an employee, I was like, man, this is bull. bull. And it's like now I'm like, oh, I get it because it's right. different. It's, you're it's on the other side of that. It's easy to see that, but it's so hard for medical providers to do what you've already kind of breezed over, which is we don't even think about this or, 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 what it's, or even just being able to create it because it's, create, it's already, once again, the same thing we always mm -hmm. say. We, we roll into it in the hospital. I mean, there are times you roll into well, a unit and, yeah. and you don't vibe and you end up moving or transform, but it's already created for us and it's already, and it's something. Yeah, well, let's take it or leave it. It's not you talked don't have about a say. enough in entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. really. Creating a, creating yeah. a culture. It's, it's not a whole talked thing. about mm -hmm. enough. And how am I going to do it? What are, what? It's almost like it needs to be a vision board of like, okay, it's just me though. I don't know. Well, you think do about pillars. This. Like, you know, and yeah, you what pillar, are my values? And, yeah, what and, are my core and, values? And, yeah. and, and, then, and then you build those core values off of pillars to people, growth. You know, there's financials. I mean, that's it's just what it is. Like, yeah. there's got to be a level of that. Um, so, in terms of creating culture, um, you spoke about unlimited t PTO and then working from home. And the if you if you the problem with a lot of medical providers, they don't have leadership experience, and it is not an assumed role. Mm -hmm. It is um, again, I have a whole doctorate, and my whole doctorate is in leadership because it is an entire. It's an area of it's just no, it's no different than business. There's it's you can be an expert in business, you can be an expert in leadership. That doesn't necessarily make you a leader, but you can still their principles and theories. It's not all about experience, and experience does not equal leadership. By no stretch of the freaking imagination does experience necessarily equal a leader. Um, but we do unlimited PTO and and work from home because we believe what we really believe in the pillar is autonomy. Right. We, the the cultural pillar that that all falls under is you know you can call it whatever you want, but for us we call it autonomy that we believe that the people that we bring on board that vibe with our culture are invested enough and we're invested in them enough that they wouldn't abuse said things. Right. And for some people who have a lot um, more, not necessarily antiquated, but it is kind of an old corporate view of like, well, if I don't see you, you're not working. It's a trust issue. Yeah. Or, uh, or if, I, if I give them unlimited PTO, they'll take it all the time. Well, no evidence and research has very clearly shown over the last 10 years that that is not the case at all. Mm -hmm. That's like the four day work week versus exactly. some of the stuff that Europe has, has implemented. Well, a lot of American companies. Mm -hmm. and breaks and stuff. And then we are really big on like, we do once a week try to get as many people in the room at the same time together just to have a little like, yeah. you know, face to face, you know, in this room right now, just sit in a U shape or a circle shape or whatever, just yeah. to open office environments, you know, as we build this corporate office, you know, the, the main floor that'll have uh, a lot of the offices, I want glass doors and then I want, you know, just an open, like almost like a we Yeah, space. very, very Google, very, yeah, That's how yeah. we do it. I'm just saying that's how like we well, kind of do it yeah. or that's how we envision it and do it now. And I mean, what cult we want. half a culture's reading the room. 
uh, and adapting a little bit of what you want people to come in and fit your culture at its absolute base and foundation. But then that doesn't mean it can't shift a little bit, like with new personalities or whatever the case is. You can, you can, but you have a foundational that you know pillars of values and, and that you stand on. Yeah. And then the other stuff can can shift and navigate mm -hmm. as necessary. Yeah. And one of our employees made a good point um, to today actually because when we were talking about talking about this on the podcast and said that. She had mentioned to a group of people considering coming on with my that we don't tolerate, you know, we don't tolerate mean girls. And and this is going to, this goes off on another little tangent of what's kind of happened of recent this year with some drama and stuff. And it's so much in the aesthetics industry. It's already nursing in general. There's a nursing, eat your own young. Then you get in the aesthetics industry. And I say it all the time, and excuse my language, an asshole industry. And we have stood strong on not being that. People... You know, we, not everything can be given for free by, by any means, but at the same time, there's a level of kindness and a level of like, you know, you collaboration. Ask a, collaboration, you yeah. ask a basic question, lifting the industry up as a whole. And it's not just like every, you know, it's not just on like good training programs, it's just on how we treat each other in this industry. And so, with that being said, we, it's an absolute like zero. To you know, tolerance well, we policy. believe that by elevating the industry or elevating each other within Smiley, we're elevating the whole. Right. Which is again another just cultural aspect of if when we're where we go, where I go, you go, we go. When we all go together collectively, then that elevates everybody and everybody goes farther. Right? And that's a yeah, what you just said. We haven't said that in a long time, but that was huge, especially last year when we, you know, we were I don't want to say convincing, but we were convincing people that hey, we. It's not going to be everything you dreamed of right now, but we plan on doing everything we can, and we will show you that, and here's how we have done it, and here's what we're going to do. And a lot of that is very excitedly coming to fruition for, for us, but those people had to trust that mentality, mm -hmm. and then we've, had, we've maintained it, and then now we're thankfully proving it, which we're so fortunate to do. But, but a lot of that happened with collaboration right. in the industry. And, yeah, and, yeah. And, 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 you know, this whole community over competition thing that I think it's overused because I think a lot of people use it and then don't um, actually do it. So, but we really do believe that elevating the whole or one person can elevate the whole and that's kind of how it all stands. And that's the, how we feed into right. Smiley. Yeah. Um, okay. So let's do, I always leave that computer where I have to get up, but that's fine. We had some few um, some Patreon people that we like shouting out, and it's Amanda G and Elise Sh W, Chad J, Kendall D, and Tina M. We appreciate your support very much on Patreon. Um, we always put a plug in for it. Um, obviously, the YouTube channel is free. We load so much stuff on that Patreon um, almost every day. I, tr I tried to slow down a little bit. Um, but, yeah, because you're going to run out of stuff to load. Well, no, there's always full injection videos. There's always something to put up there. There's so many things. Um, and we take customized requests. And um, so if you're, um, you know, needing a place to find some stuff and some information from beginner to already have your established meds ball, mm -hmm. um, we do that. And there's legal stuff, oh, yeah, and business do, stuff. Yeah, and, oh, there's a bunch. There's a lot of compliance stuff, uh, guidance, um, not advice, but... We go live every month. We'll have our second live this month with all three of us where anything can be asked by any patron, um, legal, business, clinical. Um, so worked hard on it. We continue to work hard on it, and we will, we will continue to work hard on it. So um, it's just Smiley Aesthetics. It's patreon.com slash Smiley Aesthetics. Um, the one question we did not answer, Carla answered. We had a question about what types of insurance do I need. I think she answered that very well based on kind of where you're at. And what you're doing obviously for mobile you don't really have a general liability policy but um you know the malpractice we have every single provider no matter what they're doing within smiley has their own individual malpractice policy and just as a little caveat we are additionally smiley sex and additionally assured on it um and so that's just the basis you need that as a provider if you're if you're doing medical procedures um the other question i got was how much highlight to keep in the meds ball um pretty basic question it varies across the industry uh, I like to say 600 to 2400. Um, the most I've ever seen someone say you should have is 2400. That would be six boxes. There's four boxes of Hylinex of 150 four units. Four vials. Four vials. Well, yeah, they yeah, can really I know. But... I mean, four vials of 150 units in a order uh, of Hylinex. Um, and some argue you should have four of those in your med spa at one time, whereas others say just having one box on hand at all times, a full box. So if you get into that box because you dissolve someone's, you know, lips and you have half a box, you should have the, you should order another, another box. box. Um, so there's not a protocol for it. 
um, somewhere out there, someone out there in the industry, well respected, I can't remember exactly who at the point is working on actual Hylinex protocol, which would be amazing. Um, like evidence based, this is what you should use in this instance. This is what you shoot for this. I think it's gonna be tough because, but still, it'll be nice to have kind of an idea and a standard to go off of. Yeah, which some is guidelines where laws come from. Yeah, yeah, that'll that'll be a set of guidelines. So for um, at least have at the very least, I really promote the one um, box, full box of Hyalinex for your emergency use that you're shoving in, in the instance of you know hopefully not, but vision changes, and then multiple. You're never gonna be wrong to have multiple. Um, multiple 600 unit boxes on hand, um, but at the minimum have at least one. Um, okay, I think that's that's all. If you like this, like we always say, please share it with other people. We're just trying to do what we're doing. If you have any comments, keep them coming. The comments have been great. Questions um, are we always, I'm at Injector Smiley on Instagram and she's C Smiley Injector on Instagram. Our attorney is at Court Approves Aesthetics, Court, Courtney, Court Approved Aesthetics. Um, we post a lot of stuff on there as well. Um, and then the Patreon, like I said, is at Smiley Aesthetics. And all the feedback we can get, we're just trying to get as much out there as we can. So, yeah. Share um, it if you enjoy it. Yep. Share it if you enjoy it. Um, and we'll if you enjoy me and Mary see just talking. you next time. All right. Bye. Bye. Ah. Uh, you always do that. Sorry.